2008 was a big year for the Rolling Stones. Not only did it herald their biggest success on the British album charts since 1970, it brought up a major milestone for the two youngest members of the original lineup. Born in the same hospital in Kent just five months apart, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards had made it to pensionable age. Just one year earlier, their five-leg Bigger Bang Tour had finished up raking in nearly 660 million US dollars to become the highest grossing concert tour in history. In case there was any doubt that they could still cut it live, director Martin Scorsese preserved one of their recent two-hour concerts for posterity by committing it to celluloid. His documentary, Shine a Light, proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that after 45 years of playing together, the Rolling Stones could still lay claim to the title the greatest rock band in the world. another lot of hitchhikers. That's what they look like to motorists speeding towards Hull. You can't blame the drivers. They're keeping their eyes on the road the way Ernie Marples wants them to. Little do they know they're having their legs full because these apparent hitchhikers, so blandly ignored, are five of the most famous young men in show business, the Rolling Stones. The destination of the Rolling Stones... The story began back in London in 1962 with a 20-year-old guitarist's determination to form his own rhythm and blues band. Brian Jones, who gave himself the stage name Elmo Lewis, persuaded Mick and fellow guitarist Keith to join him, and along with Dick Taylor on bass, Ian Stewart on piano, and Mick Avery on drums, they played their first gig as the Rolling Stones at the Marquee Club on the 12th of July, 1962. By December, Dick Taylor had been replaced on the bass by Bill Wyman, and when Mick Avery left, the boys already had their eye on a drummer from another band. It was a blues band, and they came and sat in. I knew Brian first of all, and then I met Mick and Keith, and, and Mick was a singer with Alexis. He had about four singers that he'd alternate whoever, uh, whoever was available, really. That's how I first met them, and then uh, I suppose a little while went by and uh, then they just asked me to join. The shy and jazz-obsessed Charlie Watts turned out to be the perfect fit. Wherever they go, and you get a lot of travelling. From the outset, their ambitious 19-year-old manager, Andrew Oldham, was grooming his scruffy protégés to be the opposite of the family-friendly Beatles. He set out to ensure they were hated by older generations to preserve their popularity with the young. The legend goes that it was Andrew who came up with the line, would you let your sister go with a rolling stone, that went on to become a magazine headline. Gigs frequently erupted into violence. At one concert in Blackpool, Bill Wyman remembers that a gang of drunken Scots made their way to the front and started spitting at the band. After ignoring warnings to stop, Keith allegedly kicked one of them in the head. Things also got ugly at a gig in Holland in October, where fans threw debris and wrecked seating before ambulances arrived to take away the injured. The trouble at concerts enraged the authorities and incurred the vilification of the tabloids. The Daily Mirror declared, these performers are a menace to law and order, and a result of their formula of vocal laryngitis, cranial fur and sex is the police are diverted from bank robberies, murders and other forms of mayhem to quell the mob violence that they generate. Just as Andrew Oldham had predicted, the bad press did nothing but fuel their popularity amongst the disenfranchised youth, and on the eve of their second US tour, they were presented with an award by Britain's Melody Maker magazine. Sydney's mascot airport and teenagers are working up to give the Rolling Stones pop group a welcome even more frantic and disorderly than the one given the Beatles just six months ago. The climax came as the big jet taxi... Somewhere in between their gruelling touring schedule, which saw them pack in more than 200 gigs around the world in one year, 
The Stones found time to pump out hits like a cover of Willie Dixon's Little Red Rooster and Tell Me, written by Mick and Keith. Their second album, The Rolling Stones No. 2, went to number one in the UK, and in June 65, they scored their first international number one with the song I Can't Get No Satisfaction. It spent four weeks atop the US singles charts and confirmed the band as a worldwide top billing act. But just as the Rolling Stones were reaching their peak in terms of popularity and critical success, things were starting to go awry internally. Although Mick was the band's undisputed frontman, it was Brian Jones who had always been considered the leader. Not only had he given the Rolling Stones their name, he continued to dictate the direction of the band and make business decisions along with Andrew Oldham. Rolling Stone magazine once wrote, if Keith and Mick were the mind and body of the Stones, Brian was clearly the soul. And Bill Wyman remembers him as a better natural musician than the rest of the band put together. However, as Mick and Keith's songwriting grew stronger and the band moved further away from its rhythm and blues roots into rock, Brian seemed to sense that he was losing control of his beloved creation. Photographer Jared Mankiewicz, who worked closely with the Stones from 1965 to 1967, remembers a particularly tricky shoot. But Brian Jones was, was being quite difficult sort of lurking in his collar, the collar of his big brown fur coat, hiding and, and, and burying himself in a newspaper that he'd brought with him. And I was really concerned that, that he was going to mess the pictures up. And I said to Andrew, I'm worried about Brian. Jared Mankiewicz wasn't the only one. It's fair to say that by the age of 22, Brian had already lost control of his personal life, having fathered five children by five different women. In June 1965, his on-again, off-again girlfriend, Linda Lawrence, finally left him and he was hit with a paternity suit by the mother of his third child. 1967 kicked off with the release of Between the Buttons and its single, Let's Spend the Night Together, which neatly bolstered the Stones' rebellious image, just ahead of the famous Redlands drug bust, which finally gave the establishment an opportunity to get their own back on the bad boys of pop. Acting on a tip-off from the News of the World, the West Sussex Police raided a party at Keith's home in West Wittering. The story goes that when the police arrived at around 7.30 on a Sunday evening, Mick's girlfriend, Marianne Faithful, was sitting between two men on the sofa, wearing nothing but a fur-skin rug. Mick was arrested and accused of unlawfully possessing amphetamine tablets, while Keith was charged with allowing his premises to be used for the purposes of smoking Indian hemp. But if things were looking grim for them and their co-accused, Robert Fraser, poor old Brian was in even worse shape. After spending his 25th birthday in hospital, Brian's stormy relationship with Anita Pallenberg had ended with Keith whisking Anita off to Spain. On the day of Mick and Keith's arraignment in Chichester, Brian and his friend Prince Stanislas Kloskowski were arrested for possessing drugs after a raid on Brian's flat turned up hashish, prescription pills and traces of cocaine. While Brian confessed to smoking pot, he denied using anything harder. Whether or not he was telling the truth, Brian's claim was backed up by the observation of Gerard Mankiewicz. The grittier aspects of touring, the sexier, druggy aspects of touring were actually not very prevalent. I mean, there weren't a lot of drugs around. There was some alcohol, there was a bit of dope. There wasn't really anything heavy. And if there was, it was very kept very much in, 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 in the background. I wasn't really aware of it at all. Brian was to be condemned to a nervous wait while his bandmates sat trial. First, it was Mick's turn. After a morning in court, Mick and Robert Fraser were rather peckish. Mick ordered prawn cocktail, roast lamb with mint sauce, topped off with fresh strawberries and cream, while Robert enjoyed a lunch of ice melon, salmon salad and fresh fruit. Each of them washed their meals down with half a bottle of Beaujolais at 10 bob apiece. The wine may have helped soften the blow of being found guilty and slapped with a three-month sentence. Keith ended up receiving a one-year stretch. The establishment had put the Stones on notice that the honeymoon was over. 
However, the following month they were set free on appeal and at a press conference afterwards, Mick shrugged off the role model label that the press seemed so eager to pin on pop stars. I'm not quite sure if this responsibility is quite as great as they make out because I believe that individuals really have their, make their own minds up more than people think. They really don't follow <clears throat> that much. You know, I mean, if, if they'd have followed Paul McCartney, you know, if all the Beatles fans in the world have followed Paul McCartney, just they would have taken acid by now, which I'm sure isn't the case. He rejected the idea of using his celebrity to push any kind of political or social agenda. Never done that in any way, over anything, over religion, over drugs, over politics, over anything. I've never, because I don't consider myself knowledgeable enough or, or a responsible enough leader. And he seemed unrepentant when asked whether he condoned taking drugs in private. It's against the law, you know, I mean, that, that's not necessarily, I mean, it, it was against the law at one uh, point not so long ago in the judicial history of this country to commit su to attempt to commit suicide and some of those people who attempted to commit suicide were put in prison. I think looking back on it, it seems rather a barbaric law and we might at one stage look back upon this set of laws and consider them in the same way. With Mick showing no signs of remorse in the wake of his brush with the law, another example needed to be made and next it was Brian's turn. He pleaded guilty to allowing drugs to be used in his South Kensington flat. On giving evidence, he admitted that he had taken drugs in the past to a slight extent, but went on to say that he'd now decided to have absolutely nothing to do with them. He said that they'd only brought him trouble in the past and disrupted his career. Brian was sentenced to nine months for possession of cannabis. Even though his sentence was commuted to three years probation upon appeal, his conviction was upheld and he was ordered to seek immediate help. Just to rub things in, Keith was now shacked up with his ex and Mick, who was enjoying a high-profile romance with Marianne Faithful, was starting to flex his muscles within the band. One day when we were doing the Satanic Majesties, Mick in front of me came up with another photographer in tow and announced to Andrew um, that this guy was going to do the new cover and this is what was going to happen. And I just knew that that was it. I packed my bags and, and that was it. Brian, by this time, was making only sporadic contributions to the music. But that didn't stop the Stones returning to chart-topping form with The Beggar's Banquet, which spawned mega-hits like Jumping Jack Flash, Street Fighting Man and Sympathy for the Devil. But just one week after the rather messy launch of Beggar's Banquet, Brian was in big trouble once again. After a raid on his rented Chelsea flat, he was sent up on another charge of possession of cannabis. When he was found guilty in September, despite already being on probation, Judge Seaton refused to send him to jail and instead urged him to get clear of the drugs. Despite the judge's mercy, the second conviction put pay to any chance of Brian being granted a visa for a tour of the US to promote Beggar's Banquet. Things were coming to a head, just as Mick and Marianne again fell foul of the law. They were busted for possession of cannabis resin when the police raided their home in Chain Walk. While they were waiting for their day in court, the time had come to deal with a more major hindrance to the band's progress. The rapidly combusting Brian, with his declining health, inability to tour and lack of musical contribution to the band, left them nowhere to go. And after Mick, Keith and Charlie drove out to his farm to break the news, Brian agreed to bow out, announcing that the Stones music was no longer to his taste and that the only solution was to go their separate ways. Without as much as a grace period to let the dust settle on that announcement, the band immediately lined up a photo shoot to trot out their new guitarist, Mick Taylor. Would you like to say a few words? How do you feel about all this? I feel about joining the Rolling Stones, right? I'm very sort of happy to be joining them, you know. Good. I think things are going to go really well when we start working. Just like that, the soul of the Rolling Stones had been removed and replaced, and it was business as usual. Three weeks later, Brian Jones lay dead at the bottom of a swimming pool at his home in Sussex. After spending the night drinking and watching TV, he and three friends had gone for a swim. Brian was left on his own in the pool, and when one of the women returned to check on Brian, who suffered from asthma, 
she found him lying motionless under the water. Attempts to revive him failed and he was declared dead just before 1am on the 3rd of July 1969. The coroner declared death by drowning, drugs and liver degeneration after an autopsy revealed that he had been suffering from pleurisy and an enlarged heart at the time of his death. While there have been many conspiracy theories surrounding Brian Jones's death, Bill Wyman remains convinced it was an accident and that Brian himself would not have been surprised at his passing. He recalls that when Keith Richards once predicted he would never make 30, Brian's simple response was, I know. With a free Rolling Stones concert scheduled in Hyde Park two days later, the press was awash with speculation that the show would be cancelled out of respect for Brian. But the concert went ahead as a tribute to the dead guitarist. More than a quarter of a million fans for once gathered peacefully to hear Mick give a brief speech and then read an extract from Shelley's Adonai as a eulogy to Brian. The band played for an hour in the sweltering heat and just as quietly as they had arrived, the crowd respectfully melted away. After that tribute, Mick remained true to the spirit of the band's name and kept on rolling. By the time Brian's coffin was carried to its final resting place in Cheltenham five days later, he had already left the country to star in the film Ned Kelly, leaving other members of the band to mourn a groundbreaking artist whose very death made him a founding member of the Elite 27 Club of musicians who died at the age of 27. Meanwhile, things were going badly for Mick and Marianne. Their relationship had been deteriorating since Marianne had miscarried their daughter the year before. And not long after they arrived in Sydney, she fell into a coma following an alleged massive overdose of barbiturates. Although she eventually recovered, their relationship did not. Tensions were increased by the events at Altamont Speedway in Northern California at the end of the year. The infamous free concert ended in disaster. The 300,000 people who attended were terrorized by the Hells Angels, who were hired as security guards for $500 worth of beer. Then, while the Stones were playing, a young fan who had drawn a gun was stabbed and kicked to death by one of the bikers in full view of the stage. The Stones were forced to continue their set in order to prevent a full-scale riot. Matters weren't helped by the couple's further trips to court the next year, which resulted in Mick being fined £200 for possession of cannabis. By 1971, it was all over with Marianne, and after a brief affair with Marsha Hunt that produced a daughter, Mick got engaged to his female look-alike, Nicaraguan model Bianca Perez. Well, I'm very glad that everything... According to Bianca, the striking resemblance certainly hadn't been lost on Mick, who felt he was looking into a mirror when they met. She was later quoted as saying, I want to be frank, Mick wanted to achieve the ultimate in sexual experience by making love to himself. In May 1971, he chartered a plane to fly guests out to his wedding in Saint-Tropez. The guest list read like a who's who of the British pop scene and included Ron Wood, Ronnie Lane and Kenny Jones of The Faces, Ringo Starr, Paul McCartney and Paul's wife Linda. What was intended to be a low-key affair turned into a three-ring circus as soon as the media got wind of the intended venue. Ever aware of the benefits of keeping things sweet with the press, Mick was diplomatic in his attempts to shoo the hordes away. No, I love you all. I don't think we can do it with your people stuck in a face. He tried it again in French, but they weren't going anywhere. After managing to get through the ceremony in the 17th century Catholic chapel, the frenzy continued outside. Commenting on Mick's wedding to the beautiful Bianca, Keith reportedly said, the devil certainly looks after his own. The wedding marked the beginning of the Rolling Stones' famous tax exile. After recording and releasing Sticky Fingers on their own record label, the band moved to the south of France on the advice of their accountants. They hung out in Keith's rented villa and recorded in the basement. The resulting album, Exile on Main Street, is now generally regarded as one of their very best. However, the 70s also brought disputes with their American manager, Alan Klein. 
Drug problems within the band were also deepening, especially for Keith, who was racking up an impressive collection of arrest warrants. The resulting visa restrictions made plotting tours more and more of a logistical nightmare. Amid such frustrations, Mick Taylor quit and was replaced by Ron Wood, who immediately gelled with Keith and seemed able to cope with his excesses, although no one was able to keep him on the straight and narrow. In 1976, Keith crashed his Bentley on a motorway. He escaped unhurt, but at the police station in Newport Pagnell afterwards, the pocket of his jacket was found to contain a small amount of drugs. Keith was fined £1,000, but that was just a warm-up for the big one. In Toronto the following month, he and Anita were busted for possession of 22 grams of heroin. Keith was charged with importing narcotics into Canada, which carried a minimum seven-year sentence upon conviction. He was remanded on bail of $1,000, and as the case dragged on and on, Keith looked almost certain to go down. In the end, he got off pretty lightly with a suspended sentence and was ordered to play two free concerts for the Canadian National Institute of the Blind in Ontario. But by the end of the nail-biting ordeal, he was finally ready to swear off the drugs. As Keith got more sober, he started to assert more control in the studio, causing tension with Mick. Relations within the band reached a low in the mid-80s when Mick embarked on a solo career and toured alone, although he was quick to dismiss rumours of a split. Well, I think the Rolling Stones are a wonderful uh, institution. It's a bit like an, a sort of nice English country house, and it sort of leaks a bit, but people still want to see it. And I think the Rolling Stones still uh, will go on. I hope they will. And I hope they go on and make more records and tour again, but right now this is what I'm doing for this year. At the tender age of 45, he was already fielding questions about when he might give away the tight pants and loud guitars. I don't know, I'm pushing the boundaries here. It's never been pushed this far before. But while Mick may have enjoyed having his cake and eating it, Keith famously referred to this period of their relationship as World War III and has been publicly disparaging of Mick's solo output, which has never been particularly well received by critics. However, 20 years later, on the eve of releasing his best of album, Mick remained defiantly proud of his solo efforts. First of all, you know, you have to be pleased with everything that you do. You have to be pleased for it yourself, you know. And then, and then when you play it to other people, you want all your friends to like it, and then you want critics to like it, and then, and you know, of course you want the greater public at large to like it. And, and, and I think, you know, I think that uh, you have, you have oftentimes good success with yourself and good success with the public. Sometimes critics don't like things. And you, and, and you sort of, you know, you can realise, the re you, you figure out the reason why they don't like it or they're very prejudiced or they're, you know, they don't like you anyway and they get a good chance to have a go at you. But, you know, I'm quite pleased with uh, and I hope people like this, this collection. Not to be outdone, Keith released his own album in the 80s called Talk Is Cheap, which went gold in the US and garnered mostly positive reviews. While Keith and Mick were at war and little was happening with the band musically, it was 52-year-old Bill Wyman who stole the headlines by marrying 19-year-old Mandy Smith. She's young enough to be his granddaughter. He'll be drawing his pension when she's only 32. But the wheel has come full circle for the 60s rebel. Their marriage blessing could not have been more traditional. The child bride and her husband wanted all the establishment trappings. Mandy had been just 13 when they met and their courtship had caused a scandal. There was a, there was a few problems on the way, but we finally made it. Mick's missus gave them the thumbs up. Well, I wish him lots of luck. I think it's a very good idea to get married. Charlie Watts, however, was rather less optimistic. I don't think it's a good match. I said I'm happy for him. I mean, I don't know anything about it. Bill, who sits at number 10 on Maxim magazine's Living Sex Legends list for allegedly sleeping with a thousand women, has since conceded that his marriage to Mandy, which ended in divorce in 1991, was a result of his midlife crisis. Finally coming to terms with the ageing process, two years later he announced his retirement from the Rolling Stones. And uh, we're still great friends, I still see them and chat to them, 
But I just, I just really don't want to do it anymore. I've done enough. It's 30 years. And then there were four. While Bill was replaced on bass by Daryl Jones, Mick, Keith, Charlie and Ronnie have remained the band's core members. And they faced the press together ahead of their post-apartheid tour of South Africa in 1995 to promote the Voodoo Lounge album. In 1998, they finally managed to take the tour bus to Moscow. At a press conference, Mick explained that they had been trying to get permission to play there for 40 years. And although many of their Russian fans may have preferred to greet their heroes in their heyday, they were still very welcoming of the wrinkly rockers. While the Rolling Stones were playing to pack stadiums in Russia, Bill and his new outfit, the Rhythm Kings, were going back to their roots and playing rhythm and blues in small clubs. The point is, with the Rhythm Kings, there's no limit to what you can do. You can approach anything um, of any style and from any era with the talent of musicians and singers I've got in the band. You can do anything from reggae to blues to jazz to country rock. I mean, to country blues, to rock, to jump music, reggae, I've said that. Um, just a whole mixture. Um, and early rock and roll. Bill wasn't the only old stone who was feeling nostalgic. On the eve of his 60th birthday, Charlie indulged himself by gathering 10 of Britain's top jazz musicians to play a series of gigs at London's top jazz venue, Ronnie Scott's. Not known for being talkative, he did have a few words to spare on the subject of ageing. I'm quite happy being 60 and I'll be quite happy 70. When Mick's 60th birthday rolled around in 2003, he and the rest of the band were invited to celebrate at the British Embassy in Prague. They were in the Czech capital to strut their stuff in front of 60,000 fans at the Prague National Stadium as part of their 40 Licks tour. Although they were still packing them in after more than 40 years of playing together, Mick had to admit that there weren't quite as many screaming female fans as there used to be. It was all men, Charlie says. It was all men. I don't know what that says. Um, they left all the girls at home or what, I don't know. Usually we get a few sort of bits of underwear on the B station last night as a few Y fronts, but anyway. The 40 year celebrations also included the release of their four flicks DVD. With such a long career behind them, there was no shortage of bonus extras. Yeah, a lot of stuff, like you're there, you know, like, but you're not. But you are, you know, there's a lot of backstage stuff, but there's a lot of show. There's three shows and, uh, you know, a documentary, a couple of documentaries and sort of bootleg stuff and some old stuff, you know, there's a bit of everything. Keith seemed to be having a little difficulty getting his 60-year-old head around all the new technology. I, I'm really, yeah, I'm not that way inclined, so I'm still learning. But, uh, hey, DVD is cool, you know, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm learning. Apparently, one thing that wasn't cool, as far as Keith was concerned, was Mick's decision to accept the offer of a knighthood. In reaction to the news, Keith is reported to have made it known that he didn't fancy taking to the stage with someone wearing a coronet and sporting the old ermine, and said it's not what the Stones is about, is it? Many of the band's fans were also disappointed with Mick's apparent abandonment of the anti-establishment stance that had brought him fame and fortune. But Sir Mick seemed unperturbed by the criticism as his chauffeur-driven limousine pulled up in front of Buckingham Palace to accept what Keith had described as his effing paltry honour. Afterwards, he appeared suitably gentrified. It was rather wonderfully... Um... Uh, formal and some wonderful outfits I noticed everyone there. It's, what's rather good is like there's everyone represented from all over England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland and from every walk of life from uh, you know historians to beekeepers. This is rather great. <laughs> A tiny trace of the old anarchy however remained in the fact that he had kept Her Majesty waiting 18 months before turning up to accept the honour in the company of his 92 year old father Joe and two daughters. Well, I've been on tour, you know, I chose the convenient date for myself and the palace have all been very uh, uh, understanding of that and I'm sure they are with lots of other people. Not everyone can turn up on the first one. I've been on tour, so it's the first date that was good for me when my family could all be here, I chose. To Keith Richards' complaints, his reported response was, I think he's a bit like a bawling child who hasn't got his ice cream. But then Sir Mick can never be said to have suffered much from self-doubt. 
Well, you know, you're always pleased with what you do, you know, as well you wouldn't do it. You know. The cock-strutting stage performances that earned him the title of the greatest front man in the world are a testament to his supreme confidence, not only as a performer, but also in his private life. Over the years, his famous conquests have included Carly Simon, Chrissy Shrimpton, and former Brazilian model Luciana Jimenez Morad. Since splitting up with Jerry Hall in the late 90s, Mick's penchant for larger-than-life lovers has led him into the arms of six-foot-four model Loren Scott. Despite fathering seven children with four women, he has only been down the aisle twice. While working on the soundtrack of the 2004 remake of 60s classic Alfie, journalists asked if he saw similarities between himself and the commitment-phobic, womanising main character. There's Alfie and every woman, every man too. Um, now I think, you know, Alfie's this young, attractive man, you know, and, and, and you think, I think the whole idea at the beginning of the picture is that, you know, he's, why shouldn't he have lots of girlfriends? It seems perfectly natural that he would because they're all throwing themselves at him. But then, and then it's quite amusing how he deals with them and so on. Because it's only a bit later on that you get, when, you, when that draws you into the picture that you feel then you see the problems that that creates and so on. Um, but, but, you know, he's, he, he is a guy that has a lot of girlfriends, lots of love affairs, but he doesn't have much else going on. I mean, he doesn't have, uh, you know, he drives a car, he's at a very repetitive job, doesn't really have any interest in anything else. He's not interested in anything, as far as I can work out in the picture, except seducing more women. <laughs> well, the same certainly couldn't be said of Mick. Aside from acting in a few movies over the years and writing the odd soundtrack, he also owns his own production company, Jagged Films. Although Mick has been criticised in the past for not lending his celebrity to humanitarian causes, he recently did his bit by dipping into his reported £200 million fortune to finance a pop video to publicise the terrible situation in Sudan's Darfur. All you can do in a very small way if you're a celebrity in some of these things is to keep the thing in front, in the agenda. Uh, uh, keep it in the public uh, uh, agenda, keep it in the political agenda as much as you can. Then there is his solo work. After more than 30 years of pumping out songs from his various solo projects and soundtracks, he finally sat down to make sense of them in a 17-song collection called The Very Best of Mick Jagger. The process made him quite sentimental. Well. I, I suppose you're always attached to the beginnings of your career when you're really young, in a lot of ways. And you, you know, the, when you're young, so much happens so quickly, and it's all t telescoped into this very small time frame. But many things happened. His best of solo album included collaborations with John Lennon and his daughter Caris, proving that you can teach an old dog new tricks. He even learned a thing or two from Lenny Kravitz. He had this house in Miami, so it's. So when I turned out, I thought we were going to be writing together, and I went to his little studio, and he said, so this is it. And I said, yes, OK. So he plays me this, and it's the track. It's completely the track. It's all him playing, all him drumming, but there's no vocals. And I said, so yeah, well, I thought we were going to write the song. He said, yeah, but now you have to write the lyrics and sing the song. I said, well, you, you know. So he completely finished it, and we didn't get to write it. So it's a very odd way of doing it, which actually worked out. It was fantastic in the end. However, there can be no doubt about Mick's first love. Ever since that first night at the Marquee Club back on July 12th, 1962, his spiritual home has been the stage. You know, I've just been, I was very um, blessed uh, with uh, um, being, having a lot of energy ever since I was a kid and, you know, and being very active and my parents always encouraged me and to keep, you know, in good shape and stuff. And I've always been very energetic and I feel, I don't think, um, you know, I would feel bad about doing a show if I wasn't really fit to do it. His scratchy vocals and freeform performance style have been ridiculed and parodied countless times over the past 40 years, but no other singer has come close to matching his ability to bring packed stadiums to their feet and keep them there for over two hours. What makes it work for me is being interested in what I'm doing and really keen on, on touring, being excited about getting out there on stage and also what makes it work for me is the audience and how they're responding and so on and um, so you know that's what the energy between the two is what really makes it for me.
And now, in the first performance of their 2005 tour, please welcome the Rolling Stones! In 2005, Mick and the rest of the band were in Boston to kick off the Stones' Bigger Bang Tour to a packed house in Fenway Park. He may not have experienced the Boston crowd's first time around, but after 30-odd years in the band, Ron Wood understood what kept both the Rolling Stones and their fans coming back for more. I think just giving the pleasure and feeling the adrenaline from the audience, and they feel it from us as well, it's a great, it's a great buzz, it keeps you young. <laughs> the two-hour extravaganza, loaded with Rolling Stones classics like Honky Tonk Woman, Brown Sugar and Sympathy for the Devil, also included a few numbers from the tour's accompanying Bigger Bang album. Mick described the album's sound as a good mix of the old Stones and new music. Yeah, definitely. We'll be integrating all our new songs into the new album we've got coming out, which is very vibrant and very contemporary, but yet hard-hitting, yet classical Rolling Stones. Their back catalogue of several hundred songs, sprinkled with new numbers, gave them endless options for the 35-day United States tour, which also took in Canada and Argentina. Fantastic fans in Argentina. A brilliant, loud, Masculine, noisy, Olé. football loving, enthusiastic. It, um, yeah, and many of them, and we're very happy to go there. The South American schedule also took in Brazil, where they treated equally enthusiastic fans to a free concert that closed down Copacabana Beach. But uh, it's been fascinating to watch. Uh, to watch the at night, I've been watching the guys get the stage and the lights together. During the day, the, the people just moving, it's just become, it's an amazing sight, you know, especially from way up there, you know, I mean, because they say, well, I hope we can handle it, you know. Yeah. It's just like so much action, you know, there's boats and there's planes, there's a lot of smoke. Energy coming oh, up yeah. Yeah. A lot yeah, of energy, there's you know? people on the street playing, the samba band, you know, there's people in costumes, there's just a lot of noise and very big drums. And, yeah, it's a great sight. People are still, as we're talking now, still coming in, so we don't know. Nobody comes still. Like the, 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 it's going to be a lot of people. By nightfall, more than a million fans had flowed onto the beach, and when asked what inspired them to put on the free concert, all that Latin passion was clearly rubbing off on Charlie. And the women with nothing on, <laughs> hardly. Hardly anything on. <laughs> the tour also included the band's first ever gig in mainland China. Newly cashed up fans in Shanghai were happy to hand over around 375 US dollars for a ticket. This is the Rolling Stones' first ever concert in China. It's very significant. I know the, the Stones have wanted to play China for a while, but it also, uh, also is symbolic for what's happening in China. Uh, China's you know, opening up to the world, and the bridge between you know, the international side and China is becoming a lot shorter now. In early 2006, the band took a breather before embarking on the European leg of the mega Bigger Bang Tour. While in the Southern Hemisphere, Keith took the opportunity to squeeze in a bit of beach time over in Fiji with his wife Patty. For reasons that have never been explained, he was attempting to climb a palm tree when he fell and landed on his head. Initial reports stated that he had sustained only a minor concussion, but after being flown to a hospital in New Zealand, he ended up having to undergo cranial surgery. Fans gathered outside the hospital, concerned that the years of hard partying may have finally caught up with the man of whom it was once said, if ever there was a nuclear holocaust, only two things would survive, cockroaches and Keith Richards. It turned out to be just one more chapter in a story that seems to contain as much myth as fact. One of the most famous claims made about Keith was that he had a complete blood transfusion as a cure for heroin addiction back in 1973. He has since admitted to spreading that rumour himself. Another more recent headline declared that Keith had mixed his father's cremated remains with a bit of cocaine in what may be called his strangest drug experience to date. His manager later explained that Keith's anecdote had been meant as a joke. However, Keith himself later confirmed to Mojo magazine that he had indeed snorted his father's ashes, but that he chopped them up like cocaine, not with. Back on board the Bigger Bang bandwagon, albeit six weeks behind schedule, he was still cracking the jokes at an Italian press conference. They put me out like a light, you know, and 
But um, I remember making the decision to go ahead and do it. And, uh, I was surprised myself. Usually I do the hanging from the ceiling at the idea of brain surgery, you know. But uh, I had total confidence in it. When, it, when you got to do it, you got to do it, you know. And I was in, woke up. I was pissed off when they woke me up because I was having such a great sleep, you know. Despite looking like he could still do with a nice long lie down, he was raring to get back on with the show. I feel great. I can't wait to get back on the stage again. You know, basically, everything's cool. For once, however, his timing was a little off with his on-stage partners. Just as Keith was coming good, Ron announced he was off for a spell in rehab to deal with alcohol problems, while Mick succumbed to a bout of laryngitis, forcing the cancellation of yet more shows. Thankfully, they were all back on form in time for the cameras to start rolling on the documentary of their concert at the Beacon Theatre in New York. When it came to choosing a director, there was only ever one real candidate. That's the first time. Basically, we had a lot of our music in Scorsese's films, and they kind of made a bond anyway, you know, before we did anything. Growing up with the Stone songs as the soundtrack to his own life, Martin Scorsese admitted he owed a lot to the band. So, for me, the sound of the music, the, the, the chords, uh, the vocals, the, the, um, I, the, entire, the entire feel of the music inspired me greatly. Uh, and while I was, how can I say, it, it, it became a basis for um, most of the work I've done in my movies, going from Mean Streets, even before, but from Mean Streets on through uh, Raging Bull all the way up into uh, Casino and, and, and to The Departed. Although Mick originally wanted to film a much larger concert, Marty sold him on the idea of taking the cameras into the much more up-close and personal atmosphere of a theatre gig. I'm just looking at it for pure, pure beauty of performance, and that's the idea. It's something I'd like to capture for people in the, in, in the future to see, to experience them. And don't forget, the cameras were placed in such positions that the audience doesn't normally get to see. That's the idea. The film, which also captured mixed duets with Christina Aguilera, Jack White, and legendary blues guitarist Buddy Guy, got the big thumbs up from Ronnie Wood. You really do feel like you're there, you know, on stage. And um, it's quite an experience for us. We actually all watched it in um, Berlin together. We, we thought, nah, we don't want to see the whole thing. It, it was quite good, you know, I, we enjoyed it. At the film's premiere in Berlin, Keith confessed the whole thing had gone off so smoothly that he hadn't even noticed the cameras. Well, this is not acting, this is me doing my thing, and, uh, and thank God that, that Martin wanted to capture it, because, I mean, I had no idea the cameras were on. I mean, I just do my thing, you know what I mean? So whatever comes out is what is. You know? Not that he's adverse to a bit of acting when the opportunity comes his way as it did when he was invited to play Johnny Depp's father in Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. That appearance earned him Best Celebrity Cameo at the 2007 Spike Horror Awards. Since then, he's fielded plenty of other acting offers, but nothing has tempted him so far. With that, it was back to their main gig and rehearsals for the final European leg of their record-breaking Bigger Bang Tour. And after 45 years of touring the world, the prospect of getting back on that bus hadn't lost any of its appeal for Charlie, who just loves to play. I mean, we have as good a time rehearsing up there with nobody in the room and two o'clock in the morning as when you're doing a big show. It's more like a strange pastime. Um, <laughs> in a funny way, it's very odd because you kind of live for the next show, which could be, you know, the next day. So you're, all the time is you're building up. And in that way, it's kind of akin to a bit like a sports being in sports because you're working up for the, you know, the, you know, you practice, you run about, you know, you play the song, you know, and rehearse. But then the actual thing is only two hours, and when it's over, it's over. And then you go, you're looking for the next one, and you pack up and you move, you know, mm. so that everything is geared to those two hours in the next place. You travel know? show, travel yeah, show. So, you know, you always, you know, that's, that's, that's the way it is. And according to their fans, they still haven't reached their peak. As they get older, they get better, without any shadow of a doubt. They get better. Like all of us, we get older, we get better, they get better. The best band you'll ever see. Can't beat them. Rolling Stones! Rolling Stones!
Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones, baby, the greatest rock and roll band in the world. Because they're brilliant. They're the best. They're, they're the best rock and roll band in the world. So who else? The Stones. But now that even the youngest member has passed 60, how long can the Stones realistically keep on rolling? Till we drop. They'll still be going when they're 70. I'll do it in my wheelchair, so will he. While they are still getting reviews like that, will there ever come a time to think about retiring? Well, I'm sure they will, but um, I'm not right there yet, so I'm enjoying what I'm doing, so that'd be great. I'm really not worrying about when I'm stopping. <laughs> and the Rolling Stones' legacy? Musician or a minstrel? Look at it, the best thing you can have on his tombstone is he passed it on. Yeah.